Thank you, Stuart. So one of the speakers yesterday commented that farmers are uh, jack of all trades and masters of none. Probably also applies to public speaking. That's an aerial picture of our farm, just to give you some perspective. Sometimes it looks green like that, other times it looks brown. I want to just talk to you about the cotton industry, some of the innovations that the industry's taken up in the past and is taking up now. And I was hoping to run, run you through some of the basic economics and the economic drivers of why we actually grow cotton. The snapshot of the Australian cotton industry, around two billion or a bit more in export earnings, fourth largest agricultural export. I see that you know, we might be sneaking up to the second largest cotton exporter in the world, despite only producing around about three or four percent of world production. Um, we do export basically every bale. We've got the highest yields in the world by a third higher than the nearest rival, and I think that's Syria. And we've, we've got double the any other country in water use efficiency. Now, I'm pretty keen on referencing things, and they're actually on the Cotton Australia website. We'll uh, reference that. The average Australian cotton farm really grows about 400 hectares of cotton, of irrigated cotton, on a family farm, generally in a mixed operation. So I guess I'm Mr. Average. There's about 800 farmers, and it can't be too bad a crop because there's four people in this audience have told me they're going to have a go at it in the next couple of years. So maybe we will have a few more producers and a bit more cotton. Again, I, Caroline's probably highlighted some of this, but I guess just talking to you about the, the green bars, uh, the production of cotton, and that's mainly been driven by water availability, whether there's water in the dams and the rivers. Uh, about five years ago, where we see this low spot here, very low water in the dams, peak of the drought, uh, 500,000, a lot of pressure on uh, fixed assets like uh, ginning facilities. And this data goes up to last year and our record drop last year. I'll also highlight over that time, however, there's been a very constant increase in yield, as by the, uh, the red line. And that continues today, and there's been a number of factors in that. A lot of that's to do with some of the things I'm now going to talk about. Genetic modification uptake. That's been one of the single biggest changes in our industry. And there was some reference to uh, GM yesterday and some of the talks regarding other industries. The uh, uptake of the insect resistant genes, we now have two in the, in the cotton plant, uh, of 98% of the Australian crop is grown with genetic modification to resist the Heliathus caterpillar as our main insect. And the photograph shows you if the, the crop on the right does not have that genetic, mo genetic modification and there is not a single scrap of cotton on that, on that uh, part of the field. It's led to a reduction in insecticide use of uh, 89%. And some of the good things for us as an industry that in the late 90s we had to defend our social licence. And some of that really came about through the GM uptake and the endosulfan, which is a, an insecticide, uh, detections in the Namoi River where I'm from virtually dropped to zero. Some of you would have had some experience with that given uh, certainly Japanese and other uh, vegetable growers use that significantly on vegetables but it's not much good when you, you can't put it on cotton anymore. We can't put it on anything anymore, it's taken out. Another GM uptake was the uptake of the Roundup Ready gene, and since 2000, that's 99% of the current crop is grown with a Roundup Ready gene. So essentially, I can, as per the picture there, I can spray over the top with Roundup as a herbicide. It kills virtually all the other uh, weeds, kills the weeds and leaves the cotton growing. It's led to a large reduction in residual herbicides, which were the, I guess the, uh, they were the things that were building up in riverine detection, uh, riverine environment, and we're certainly quite proud of the fact that the cotton has reduced its impact on the environment in that way. We're highly aware of the issue of Roundup resistance, and th that's what uh, some of the potential that may come out of Roundup ready cropping. But when you sign up for a license to grow this GMO, Attached to that is resistance management plans, which are pretty robust and have been developed by the research industry. I 
We've made some online advances, I guess. Uh, one of the uh, big issues with cotton in the past has been 2,4-D damage or phenoxy herbicide damage uh, from off from other, uh, from not spraying cotton from other crops. And it's basically down from about 11% of a small crop four years ago to virtually zero in 2012. There's been some small instances this year. And that was a full program of uh, education in the industry prom promoting uh, spray workshops for producers other than cotton growers, as well as cotton growers, uh, industry radio advice and some postals, as well as one of the main planks is a website, which is a Google-based a Google Earth based uh, website, which you can see up on the top there. Each, each of those colours, or all of those colours, are different cotton farms that each producer puts their own cotton farm onto the map. And then that map's able to be distributed, certainly in, uh, in a more blown up detail, in, in regional areas to anyone who buys a phenoxy herbicide so they know where cotton's been grown. Uh, that's, that's actually a map of northern New South Wales in southern Queensland. You can see the border of Queensland, moving around to Gundawindi, Narborise down here. It puts me in perspective. My farm's one of these tiny little dots here. Most people have probably heard of Cubby Station, and that's quite significantly a big part of this, this big chunk up here. Other online advances we're working towards is the, what was originally termed the BMP program or the Best Management Practice Program. Essentially, we looked at that as an environmental management system that benchmarks best practice. Again, it was part of our response to the need to develop a social licence in the past. And part of the measurement we have of hopefully achieving that is that graph which shows the uh, EPA complaints against cotton growers drop significantly, also coinciding with the main uptake of the GM crop. We've also commissioned as an industry three independent audits over ten, space 10 years apart. And these have been able to demonstrate continuous improvement in environmental stewardship. Just a quick plug for our uh, BMP program. It's, it's a voluntary program for our growers. It's an online program. They can go in, they can select a module to work on, and that's in this box here. You can select um, petrochemical storage and handling as a module you go through and answer a series of questions. They're associated with ranks leading from basic legal requirements through to rankings of world leading practice. And, uh, and it's a certainly a great way of us establishing where we sit. We believe in ecosystem services. It's a great thing. I guess some of the technology, you don't have to buy it. It just either walks or flies in. Uh, insects like spiders, ladybirds, Ants, lacewings, assassin bugs, they're all my friends. They eat Heliothus eggs, or Heliothus. Uh, that's one of my cotton pick of the background photograph with spider webs just draped across it. There's every different colour spider you can find running around over the heads of that cotton picker. It really scares the backpackers when they've got to get in and clean the heads out. <laughs> As, uh, the insert there is a, um, is a predatory shield beetle eating Heliothus caterpillar. So yes, I like them too. By adopting this sort of use of ecosystem services on my farm alone, we've been able to reduce our chemical dependency to, we've done, made one full farm spray in the last five years. So added on the top of GM, that's been a real benefit to us. I'm doing a cotton talk and I've got a photograph of a wheat field, sorry. But we use this capacitance probe and have done for a long time. These have been in the grape industry for a long time. It's essentially a probe in the soil that measures moistures at different levels. Uh, and sends it back a 15 minute data to the internet. I can then download that onto my uh, computer. Each line demonstrates a, a moisture level in the soil at different levels. And the levels are on the left there in the different colours. The, the dark blue line is sort of the average and it's my management tool. So if we look at the area, essentially any drop, any drop in this blue line indicates that the amount that the soil has dried out in that day and generally the plant doesn't use moisture at night, so that it tends to plateau, plateau out at night. But if there's a plateau that's sort of a general plateau over time, it usually indicates waterlogging. And some of the more recent work I do now is I also graph rainfall on that, on that to, to, to uh, agree with that. So when it's waterlogged, the plant's not growing and we're suffering problem, uh, other problems there. 
Another problem we can identify is when this graph changes shape, i.e. the amount of drop in each day starts to reduce, it's probably indicating that we've got moisture stress or the, mo the plants is starting to slow down. And that generally, you can you see it on this graph before you see it visually. So we try and really work to uh, not let that happen. And about the foot, I actually find this quite useful. It also tells me how deep my roots are. And you can see in this particular year, the roots did not reach 100 centimetres till about this time of year. Um, and, some, and it works in different soil types. We've been using for a number of years electromagnetic soil surveys to assess dam water holding capacities. And so this is one of my dams. Um, the range would be light blue right through to red, uh, passing through green and yellow. The indication would normally be that light blue is the sandiest soil, moving right through to red is the heaviest clay, and we obviously like clay to keep water, uh, to seal up and keep water in our dams. Um, interestingly, I, I did this and that sort of looked at that and said, obviously there's a problem in that corner where it's all blue. So we went around with a backer and we dug holes in the different colour spots to test it, and then we came back with a water truck and we were filling the holes with water and we were going to see how long it took to seep out. Now, when I got to the hole up here in this green patch, which is sort of an average sort of part of the field, it was already full of water. Given that's the lowest part of it, we'd actually dug down into a sand layer, and we were actually intermingling with the, uh, with the shallow aquifer there. So we were certainly refilling the aquifer every time we put water in that dam. So as part of the remediation has been to take, take that sand out of this particular area here and lay it on the top of the walls around the dam and then take some of this red soil, this clay here, and relay it in and, and compact it. Now, we managed to take that dam from a quite horrific 30 millimetres a day loss down to 13, which is still double uh, what we want it to be as absolute minimum. So there's been some other techniques. Uh, we've since put a wall across this part of the dam, given we fill it in the top corner. This bit here is relatively good at water holding. So if we only have a little bit of water, we hold it in there deep so it doesn't evaporate as much, rather than spread it out across the whole dam. And if we've got more water, we generally don't hold it in there. We'll take it off and we'll put it on the fallow fields and store the moisture in the fields. So there's different ways of managing the same problem and we've just been working towards it. Working, one of the systems installed on my farm is overhead sprinkler system. I guess I'm very aware of uh, water savings I said to you earlier that the Australian cotton crops held back by how much moisture is around. Well, certainly my farm is constrained to. That's my single limiting constraint. I do expect water savings in the, in the medium term of 25 to 30% from this system. And I can believe that through having a neighbour who's had this system for five years. And every year we compare, and every year he's in that range of less water use than I. I'm hoping for increased yields. Again, from the same perspective, a neighbour, similar soil types, with some other tools, he's been able to increase his yields in that time, so we're actually hoping well, the crop I've got under it this year will actually be our best field. One of the advantages is the ability to use rainfall events effectively. Uh, with a, a flood irrigation system, you saw with my moisture graph, when it starts to moisture stress, we want to water that crop right then. If we use a flood irrigation system, we've got to fill the profile right up. We don't have any sort of ability to not fill it up because we just flood the water down a furrow. So if we have to do that before a rain event, then the plant's then waterlogged, any rainfall just runs off and, okay, it can be reused. Whereas with this system, if I know rainfall events coming but the plant's drying out, I can just give it a quick 10 mil and then the, the soil is then still dry to absorb that moisture. It's really led to a reduction in labour. Every three days I go over and press a couple of buttons. It's fantastic not having to do siphons. Harvesting technologies have moved a long way. They've also become very expensive. Uh, one of those cotton pickers, it's you know, roughly in the region of $800,000. It gets to Australia and then the Australian cotton farmer just takes the uh, oxy to it and starts changing it, spends another 100000 on it. But it does show the level of innovation in Australia. So while that, um, that system's certainly going to probably harvest 80% of the Australian cotton crop this year um, with one person driving it. Um, so the, some of the other innovations that Australian cotton growers are doing is they put a trail on that. So rather than that bale you can see popping out the back here, there'll be one or two will be, have to be dropped in the field because the, the machine will fill it up. They, they tow a trailer behind that, drop the round bales onto the trailer. When they turn around at the end, drop the round bales off theirs. 
Some of the other innovations is uh, that truck there for transport. That's certainly an Australian invention, the Dunnett Moree. There's some new ones which we're working on which doesn't have hydraulics and uses gravity to unload. Uh, another thing, uh, moisture is a biggest issue, big issue for us. If there's too much moisture in the, in the bale, it, then the cotton will downgrade before it is processed. And there's onboard moisture monitoring now to tell you as soon as you're starting to get, uh, get too wet in the harvest at night times and to pull you up. Yield monitoring has probably been in many, many agricultural crops for a long time, I, as you can see by some of my data back in 2005. It's been how we use it, um, and that's sort of two fields, crops two years apart. You can see a significant change over the period in the, the part I've circled. Uh, that's all good and well. It tells me there's a problem. I don't, still don't know what the problem is, and that's the biggest difficulty we have with some of this data is we've got to identify what the problem is rather than just purely collecting. Now, make a point. The photograph on the bottom is, that's actually my old harvesting team. I now have a new round baler, which I have one person and someone supporting him. That team probably could do 20% more harvesting per day, but there's 16 people in there plus a cook. Um, that's a lot of people to manage, especially relatively untrained people operating big, heavy machinery, and the risks therein of OH&S issues is just frightening. So I guess that's where we've moved to. Some of the um, abilities we've got to uh, move on to. In con conjunction with GPS, GPS has been in the cotton industry for a long time, so virtually all my equipment is steered by GPS. There's a spray rig in a wheat crop again. I seem to have wheat fields, uh, wheat photos. Um, but in conjunction with those yield monitoring photos uh, and even EM surveys of fields, we're able to change our inputs, uh, like variable fertiliser rate and growth regulator weight. The, some of the latest stuff is uh, aerial photography of, of our cotton fields that measure biomass, and that's able to give us a variable prescription for that machine to put on a variable amount of growth regulant. Um, and the latest ones are small model aeroplanes, actually, and that's got a lot of people excited because they can combine a couple of passions. On to some numbers. Um, some of this data is from about uh, about four or five years ago from the Department of Ag, but it still holds fairly true. And if you look at that graph there, we're talking return per megalitre, which is obviously my constraint, and I keep telling you it's our single, most, single biggest constraint. Cotton is at the top end of the annual crops. Anything above it are, are uh, perennial. And so the, the issue there is we're in a system where we can change year to year if there's no water available. And it's, it's one of the reasons why we grow cotton. It's because we have this ability to vary with the variable systems. <coughs> Sorry, uh, okay, so 452 Department of Ag numbers. I'd be quite disappointed if my farm only yielded $452 per megalitre return. I'm aiming for 600 plus every year and getting better. And seven megalitres per hectare is, I, I believe that's researched as a reasonable industry average. We're certainly hoping to make that better. So looking at my farm now, and I, I, that's the data I've got, the green bars are my yield over time, over the last 10 years. I see we've dropped down off our relative purple patch here, but I will highlight that this has been an extremely wet period for us. On my particular farm, we've had seven floods through the farm. We had two major hailstorms in, in those years, and in the, the last year there represented, we had some severe wetting waterlogging events. However, over that time, if you look at the blue graph, that uh, is a measurement of our water use per hectare. And so certainly we started as an average of around about that seven megalitres per hectare. Now we've been able to bring that down to last year around about the four as an average. So I'm quite proud of that. We've done pretty well. And for me, when I measure efficiency, I measure it in bales per megalitre. Again, it's my single most constraint, biggest constraint. So I guess 10 years ago, we were achieving around about one bale per megalitre of water. Well, our average now is something in the region of two to two and a half. So I'm quite proud of that. Uh, I was a bit nervous at this point. The uh, CEO of Cotton Australia, a representative body said, the cotton industry is gonna double its water efficiency in the next 10 years. Now I've done my 10 year period, I'm confident I can do this again. I'll double it again in the next 10 years. 
Some gross margin data, I, I just picked a year in general. So this data comes from a comparative analysis group that I'm part of. Uh, looking at the graph, the bottom line is actually yield per hectare. So the further you go to the right, the higher the yield per hectare of all of these individual farms. And as you go up the graph, it's, it's the gross margin they've achieved. And these are actual numbers, so these are actual farms. And like just about anything, we actually have a law of diminishing return. Um, I, tr I do highlight that this is, this is my farm. I prefer to be on that part of the curve. I don't need to uh, truck that many more bales to the gin to make the same amount of money per hectare. And, and so the only time when that doesn't hold true was uh, last year when the, the harvest price was significantly higher than the, than the price beforehand, so the, the value return was much higher. Just about finished. Looking at my historical gross margins. Now, I think my bank manager's probably in the audience, so don't take any notice of that sort of trend there. There's some reasons. But the, the green bars are my cotton gross margins. Again, the last three years have, has been those wet periods and some difficulties with harvest and difficulties with fertiliser relating to significant waterlogging events has led to that drop. I'm quite confident that my average will be will return to a higher level. But if you, I haven't really made a very good comparison there, but in my rotation, I grow irrigated durum wheat, which is the yellow bars across the bottom. It's actually a reasonably consistent returner, but it returns about 20% per megalitre on what the cotton does on average. I could probably grow a corn rotation, and that would give me a higher return per megalitre, but my limiting factor is I can't pump water for my entire farm in summer. I can't pump all my water in summer, so I can't irrigate the whole farm at once. So I need to have a winter rotation, and this is the best of what I've got. Now, I'll just contrast that with dryland wheat. We've certainly seen some big variations. I've, three out of six years, I'm lucky to break even on dryland wheat, even though we do try and follow every technique we can, zero till, tram tracking, uh, canopy management, etc. That's about me. That's just some of the reasons why we do what we do and some of the exciting things that are happening in our industry. So uh, thank you very much.